without further ado, I mean, we've got the little handout that gives you in the sure. background to everything. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Well, just turn the light down just a touch. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to have my glasses in the typical cataract, after cataract surgery mode where I can read and look at the same time. Okay. So first of all, I'm delighted to be here. We're really happy to have this invitation. And I'm delighted to see all of you and thrilled that you chose to come here instead of watch the football game this morning. Because <laughs> when we booked it, I didn't realize we would be competing with the game this morning. We are recording. We, we are at home, yes, yes. <laughs> So without further ado, we'll get started. Okay. Sid? Well, Elizabeth, welcome to the Broomfield Veterans Museum. We are happy to have you here this morning. Uh, we thought we would uh, start with a little few brief questions to sort of give a little more background that's not actually in the letters necessarily. Um, before we get into Lenny and Diana's world wartime experiences, can you tell us a little bit more, more about your parents so my parents were first generation Americans. Their, their parents had emigrated from Eastern Europe. They were first generation American Jews and they went to college. Both my mom and my dad were college graduates and they actually had master's degrees. They lived in New York City and they were well educated and for their generation in the 30s they were politically active and were very concerned about the beginning of the war and what was developing. Uh, you mentioned in your book that your father deliberately preserved the wartime letters and used them to write up summaries of his experiences. Did your parents ever talk to you about the war or show you the letters? So it was, as was typical of World War II, generally most of the men did not speak about their experiences or the women that were involved. But my dad was very proud of his medals. He had earned the Bronze Star, the Silver Star, and the Purple Heart. And so I remember on a number of occasions, he took those out and shared them with my brother and me. And when I asked questions, which I would obviously after I knew he was a soldier in the war, he would often skirt the answers. He really told me very little. And it wasn't until my mom passed away and the closet with the letters was found that I began to really understand what he had gone through as an infantryman in Europe. Uh, your father was eager to see combat, and your mother was proud he was an infantryman, man, one of the most dangerous jobs in the war. What motivated him to fight in the infantry, even when he could have postponed enlisting or gotten a safer job because he was older? He was strongly motivated, and a lot of the reason that he was so motivated is that he wanted to fight Hitler. He wanted to defeat the Nazis. As I mentioned, we were a Jewish family, and we had relatives in Europe who ended up perishing in the Holocaust. So he was strongly committed and was willing to, live, to give up his life. Well, your father ended up getting wounded and receiving the Silver Star for valor. Can you tell us about that action and, so, and so, anything related? Yeah. So my dad was in Belgium. He ended up at the Battle of the Bulge. But when he was in Belgium, there was a town called Malmendy. And at the entrance to the town was a bridge. And my dad's squad, and the squad was the smallest unit of infantry soldiers. And right there is a picture of the squad on the bottom. Those were the guys, his close, close buddies. And one of them was severely injured as they were protecting the bridge. And my dad stayed with him for most of the day until the medics came. And that was why he won that medal. Oh, far from waiting around for your dad, your mom, Diana, took an active role in the war effort. Can you tell us a little about, about her wartime work? So it's kind of amazing. I still can't quite fathom this, but my mom went to night school to become a mechanic. Before that, she was a dietitian by training, and she ended up working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, building periscopes for the Navy. And I have visited the Brooklyn Navy Yard where they have an exhibit. My mom's not in the exhibit, but they have an exhibit of the women and what they were doing work <coughs> working there. And then in the evening, she was very, very involved in um, <coughs> union, organizing <coughs> union activity. Yeah, she taught classes? Yeah. OK. Did you discover any big surprises about your parents from reading through their letters and doing research for the collection? Were you able to clear up any family mysteries? 
Well, I did. I learned more probably about my parents as young adults than most anybody knows, and some of which I chose to include in the book, some of which I didn't, because it's a love story. Uh, but the thing that I think st struck me the most as being a surprise was that they made the decision to, for my mom to get pregnant, knowing that my dad might not come back. And the picture there that's on the cover of the book and right there where my dad's uh, that is the weekend, the furlough weekend, where, when I was conceived, and I know that for a fact. Um, so the thing that surprised me was once my mom knew she was pregnant, she told her parents, rather than being thrilled that they were going to be first-time grandparents, their reaction was, oh no, I mean, what happens? I think they were frightened that if my dad didn't come back, they were older and that would end up having to help raise the child. And so. It, there, there's conversation back and forth, and my dad actually writes to my grandpa, kind of explaining the thinking and hoping to get them on board, and that was just a big surprise. And also, there's a little suspicion there, you know, about... What? <laughs> you shouldn't talk about these things, and, right? Right. <laughs> anyway... Well, you were careful not to talk about being pregnant until you were sure that right. you were. Yeah. What inspired you to undertake the project? What were some of its challenges? So once I knew the letters existed, I knew that there was a trove of information, tremendous information. And initially, my daughter is a writer. She's a professional writer. And thank goodness the strike ended last week. Um, and she, so I was kept saying to Amy, I want you to do something. We have these letters. Write a book. Write a, write a play. Write something. And somehow her preferences were women's issues, and she just wasn't getting around to it. And I was getting older, and I just thought, I guess it falls on me. And so I started re excerpting little pieces of the letters and typing them in my computer. And when I had about 20 pages, and my first goal was I was doing it for the family, for my kids and grandkids. And I have a close friend, Alice, who's an editor in Boulder. And I showed it to her, and Alice said to me, you have a book. This is not for your family. This is for the world. And so I kept going and plowed through almost 2,000 letters to extract what I could and not make the book so long that it wasn't readable. <laughs> and then, then the process took six years, two years to write, a year to get it edited and worked on, and then a year to find a publisher. And I, finally, it came out in August of 18. So it's five years. Okay. So from, from this little brief interview, we're going to go into our program. And again, I'm delighted to be here and share my parents' story during World War II. When World War II was raging thousands of miles away, a young, first-generation American Jewish couple embarked on an amazing journey and correspondence. Their story, told through several thousand letters, written daily over three years, some eight to ten pages long, many handwritten, and many photographed on V-mail. And I'm sure in this audience, most of you are familiar, but I speak a lot of places where nobody, they've never seen a V-mail. This is a V-mail, which was photographed and shrunk, and I had to sit with a magnifying glass. They are, it's really, really tiny. And the other letters came this way. They were regular mail. There's an airmail stamp, six cents on it, and it would be written, this went to my mom, and in the back is my dad's private first class address. So first I began to read my dad's letters from overseas, thinking that that would be most interesting. I really wanted to know what he had done in Europe. And then I started thinking, well, what was my mom doing at the same time? And I was lucky enough to have her story. So my book is unique, as I said. From all my research, there's no other book quite like it that reads as a conversation with both the woman's letters and the man's letters. And my mom's letters give a very, very good first-hand account of the home front. And there really isn't a great deal written about the home front. It was a tremendous challenge for me to decide what to include and how to make it work. What ended up happening was I wrote it as a conversation. So my mom will ask a question, and maybe two weeks later the answer comes, or my dad will say something, and then my mom will refer to it a couple of weeks later. Gener generally, it took two, about two weeks. In battle, it took longer, because they didn't pick up the mail from the soldiers. 
So it's hard for us to think about communicating only by letter and waiting weeks and weeks for mail. You know, we have so, such instant communication. If you don't reach your loved one instantly, we all panic today. And just think about your husband being in battle and waiting weeks to hear if he's okay. It's really hard for us to, to comprehend that. I've also learned that everyone has a connection to World War II. Everyone was part of the war effort. All the men went. My three uncles went. My uncle's brother went. Every family was impacted. And I was chatting with this gentleman before and saying that my uncle, my dad's younger brother, will be 98 on October 22nd this year. And he served in the Marines in the Pacific. But there are fewer and fewer of those. So everyone waited for mail. The mailman rang the doorbell on the street in Brooklyn where my mom lived if there was a letter, either from my dad or from my uncle. Everyone waited for the mail. And everyone supported the war. Bought bonds, lived with rationing, and sent multiple care packages. And one funny story that they did tell was my dad loved Hellman's mayonnaise, which is best out here in the West. And so twice, Caring relatives wrapped up a small jar of mayonnaise, one in a sweater and one in a sock, and sent him off to Mississippi where he was in basic training at Camp Shelby. And both times, the jars came in smithereens and he didn't get to have his mayonnaise. But when he was overseas, those care packages really helped to sustain the soldiers and they shared them. They would share them among the squad. My dad, like most soldiers, talked little of his, his experiences, but as I said, he showed his medals to me and my brother, and he was very proud of his bronze star, his silver star, and his purple heart. My mom never talked about those years, but imagine opening up a carton 70 years later full of letters, and that, and that from those letters emerged my story and became <coughs> the heart of my book. So my book covers three years, 1943 to 1945, and throughout the book are examples of how my parents were lucky, which is why the book is called We Are Going to Be Lucky, A World War II Love Story in Letters. Year one, my dad is in basic training and then advanced training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. What was the experience of a young man from New York City in Mississippi. How did he react to the blatant segregation in the nearby towns? And what kind of incredibly intense training did he experience for the infantry? May 1943, my dad sets off for Camp Shelby, Mississippi. May 20th, Fulton, Kentucky. Beloved, we're south of the Mason-Dixon line now and still don't know where to, but now it's southward. Got my first sight of cotton bales. Well, darling, I have now loved you in 10 states in 48 hours, and in some for the first time. Well, it's Mississippi for sure, and most likely Shelby. Lenny. Basic training was really challenging. June 5th, my dearest, to really understand my letters, you should sit in the sun, turn on all the gas jets on full flame till the temperature is about 105 degrees, sweat and perspire thoroughly. There, that's just right. Last night, when I fell in with my company and the regiment marched out in tw at twilight, we walked in silence because we were practicing a forced march approaching enemy lines. Think, if you can, of long column on column of young men in green uniforms, green helmets, brown faces, and brown rifles blending into the green forest we were entering. We've got to go six miles in an hour and a quarter. The guys suffered from heat and sweat and from dust and thirst and from fatigue and nausea and from every kind of ache and pain, but they felt, now we are becoming soldiers. This is the real test, not those right faces and left faces. They felt they must come through now, even if they had failed before. Lenny. So my dad became a scout in intelligence, often going ahead with the officers to meet with the underground because he had facility with foreign languages. He spoke a number of languages. And my mom's story, there are no other in-depth, first-hand accounts of the home front. Although my mom was in Brooklyn, New York, her story is like thousands across the country. 
totally committed to the war effort. She trained to be a machinist working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, building periscopes for the Navy, and a union organizer, a true Rosie the Riveter. What were the challenges for the women who were now working in the factories for the war effort? My mom and others had a tough time in the factory. The older men still at their jobs did not welcome the women working side by side. And they didn't make it easy. June 30th, dearest Lenny, today I had a pretty miserable day at work. It seems that every Friday something happens. You know, I've told you about the practical jokes that the men play on us. Well, this afternoon took the prize. When I returned from lunch and started to work, in about 10 minutes, there was a terrible odor all around my machine. I couldn't discover where it was, but I knew it was Limburger cheese. It made me so sick, I had to go upstairs and lie down for a while. And when, I, when, when the light became so hot, the cheese just melted. They did it to me and another girl. She became so sick, she had to go home. It may sound funny, but it wasn't, Diana. My dad endured the heat of the Mississippi swamps in July and digging trenches in the frozen ground in December, training either to go to the Pacific or Europe, they didn't know. August 24th, Lenny darling, when you write about the jungle tactics that you are learning and how you're learning to get along in the jungle, I get a little concerned because those are things I know nothing about. And and I, I, perhaps I should start learning to climb trees and hills and crossing creeks because as you know, I'm not very good at those things and you might want to continue even after victory is ours and you are back home. My Tarzan husband may require a jungle mate. <laughs> Diana. The training was unbelievably strenuous and physically challenging. September 18th, sweetheart, we're off into the woods Night had fallen long ago, and a steady rain made the, obs the obscurity palpable. Then the forest became jungle, tangled vines and thicket, tearing at our uniforms. Suddenly the ground began to slope downward more and more steeply. The blackness was so dense before us that we moved along holding one hand on the shoulder, the man in, uh, in front of us. And suddenly the four men before me disappeared, even from arm reach, and we heard the splash of water, and not a second later, I was flying kerplunk into the morass. It seems we had reached a cliff and slippery mud gravity had greatly accelerated our progress, Lenny. Coming from a union background, back at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, my mom soon became involved in trying to organize a union in her shop. She met resistance on the part of management. Not only the union organizers, but those who were just joining the union were intimidated. September 30th, dearest love, the company has definitely discovered that people are joining the union, and I think they know who started it. Their main strategy has been to try and frighten a few of us, and also to scare the others away from us. They've not come out in a full frontal attack yet, but last Tuesday, my assistant foreman called me over, and he said in a very angry voice, I hear you're going to join the union. Since I didn't want to commit myself either way, I just said to him, I'm thinking about it. And then he went into a 15 to 20 minute diatribe of why unions are bad. And when he finished, I didn't want him to think that he had frightened me in any way. So I just said, I'm still thinking about it. And I walked away. Your Diana. A major decision for my parents was whether or not to try and have a child, knowing that my dad might not return. June 10th, dearest, I saw a very cute cartoon. A woman with a baby in her arm says to another woman pointing to the baby, we call him furlough. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I come to see you, I will bring my equipment. So we won't have a furlough unless we decide to. Your Diana. <laughs> and then there's lots of discussion of the pros and cons, and they made the decision, and they were lucky. I was conceived on my dad's first furlough home from Mississippi. And that's the picture. And you might wonder, as I mentioned, how my mom's parents reacted, how my dad's parents reacted. It was, it was quite a shock for them. January 19th. 
The baby also sends his best, her best wishes to daddy. I don't know why, but I always think of the baby as a he. It really isn't certain yet, although I think the sex is already determined. And I always get a chuckle because their bio sense of biology was so primitive. You know, they didn't even know when the sex was determined. So it's just interesting. My parents were socially conscious and early on were concerned about the plight of African Americans. It was my dad's first experience in the South with segregation. February 22nd, dearest, Jackson being a capital city is metropolitan in air. It's small, a mere 40,000. It's antebellum monuments after the Civil War and buildings are few. It was burned in the Civil War and nicknamed Chimneyville as only chimneys survived the fire. Of course, under the Army's restrictive policy, it was impossible for me to visit the Negro community, but it was noticeable that Negroes appeared to move more easily than in Hattiesburg. 40% of Jackson is Negro. There are homes closer, schools nearer, Negro school, school children walking on white streets, never so in Hattiesburg. Lenny. October 3rd, dear, my dearest, let me tell you about one of the more interesting days I spent in Mississippi. I got a pass to Hattiesburg and decided to take a bus. Of course, there was a perennial unpleasantness of the colored section in the rear. Since Negroes are a majority of the population, but only six or eight seats are reserved for them, they must often wait hour after hour for a seat, while white sections may be half empty. Lenny. Dad's training year is coming to an end. April 28th. Dear Diana, all day gone with endless clothes checking and headaches. This place is a tremendous mill through which vast numbers are being squeezed under great pressure toward the invasion front. By the way, censorship begins at this point, so consider that in your letters now. Lenny. Year two. On D-Day, my dad sailed to England, and luckily for him, he missed the initial invasion where thousands died on the beaches. He was a replacement in the 30th Infantry Division, which fought in some of the most dangerous battles in Europe. San Lo in Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium, and Aachen in Germany. For almost a year, he saw combat action, and he describes he was not, he was not in a ringside seat, but he was in the ring. Luck played a part throughout. My mom became a mother, while mail became increasingly delayed, and my mom didn't even know when my dad left the US. June 20th, dearest, Today is two weeks I have not had mail from you. It's been funny, writing to you every day, not knowing where you are, whether you're on the ocean, still in the US, whether you've landed, and whether you're already doing things. I've sort of had to hold on to my emotions and keep them in a separate place in my heart. You understand what I mean, Diana and question mark. Dad is now in Normandy and wonders if the baby is born. He waited several weeks for the news. August 2nd, female. Dear Diana, some days I miss you so much and I get ever so much more eager for Junior to arrive. Blasted Nazis, six weeks, no mail, Lenny. August 6th, female. Dear Lenny, hurrah, hurrah, you have a big baby daughter weighing eight pounds, 12 ounces. You can be proud of Diana and question mark. Diana took it like a trooper. Mama and Daddy saw her soon after and said the baby is beautiful. They're already prejudiced. I hope this gets to you soon, and I also hope you're home for your daughter's first birthday. Do a good and fast job on the front now. There's so much more for you to fight for. Lucy. Your Aunt Lucy, yes. With my mom's sister, yeah. yeah. Dad's description becomes more graphic as they race through Europe after the breakout from Normandy. September 24th, dear Diana, we've seen them often enough in the movies, the tragic pictures of burning farmhouses, of panicky horses and cattle in stampede, of families pitifully trying to rescue a few belongings or the steady trickle of refugees down the dirt roads, on foot, by bicycle, drawing babies in children's play wagons in terror of the artillery shells bursting all, all around. This is the third country where I've seen that happening. It makes it very vivid to me that I'm protecting you and Betty Lou. I've seen men going at the risk of their lives through fighting lines to bring back a bottle of milk or a bag of potatoes and the heartbreaking look when it's startled by a Nazi shell explosion, he drops the bottle and sees it break on the ground, Lenny. 
Meanwhile, the fighting intensifies as they approach the borders of Germany and the Siegfried Line. It's hard for us to imagine the conditions they endured. Long marches below freezing temperature, digging trenches in frozen ground, limited K rations, not enough to keep a soldier going, and worst of all, seeing comrades fall. The deep bonds formed by the squad mate, whose backgrounds were completely different, from a high school educated farm boy in Indiana to a guy with a master's degree from Columbia University, their lives depended upon each other. Dad saves the life of one, and in turn, his life is saved by another. What were the experiences that the soldiers had with the local people? What did the Belgians do when they marched into their towns? What did the French do? And it was different. What did the soldiers do in their downtime? And one thing I didn't realize before was that they weren't in battle continuously. There were long periods of downtime where nothing was happening. Dad describes the face of war. September 26, dearest, there are scenes one never forgets and crimes one never forgives. The soldier who goes into action expects to take it because he is prepared to dish it out in total war, civilians in, in War plans can't be exempt, but there are still some criteria of humanity somewhere. When the Germans compel a town to evacuate, driving the people down a road in confusion, and then turn loose an artillery barrage on the road, well, that's the Nazis. As interpreter, I was called in by the medics to speak with the wounded, where they could still talk about where they were injured to help keep families together. There was one woman with three kids, two injured, when we got together, we couldn't locate her husband. In another case, we found the wife and two kids, along with the injured father. Of course, there were some very critical cases, and some beyond all help. Our boys have seen much, but this shocked them into speechlessness. In complete silence, they broke out what reserve K rations we picked up to feed these kids. Remember Marina in the North Star and her reply to the old farmer? She says, the face of war is not for the young. And she says, we are no longer young. There were four-year-olds there yesterday who will never be young, Lenny. What were the challenges for a new mom with her husband overseas? How did she manage on the low pay of an infantry soldier? How did rationing affect her and her child? And how did she cope living in a two-bedroom apartment with her parents, her sister, and a baby? My mom shares her feelings as a new mom. October 2nd, dearest, I realize, my darling, you can hardly advise me on the care of a baby under the present circumstances, but I know you want to know all about my problems, and also, it helps me just to write to you. In any case, I'm much calmer now than I was when I first brought her home. You see, I was very scared. I thought if she would break any minute and I must do everything perfectly or something terrible would happen. Well, by now I'm much more accustomed and comfortable handling her. I know she won't break or fall apart even if I make a mistake, Diana. A few days later, my dad writes graphically. October 6th, V-mail. Dearest, well, sweetheart, the deciding phase of the war is on and your husband is not in a ringside seat. He's in the ring and the punches are flying fast and furious. Things are now in such an interesting stage that all that happens must wait till after times to be told. In new, strange, and still hateful places, still my love goes homeward to you and all I hold dear. It is regrettable now that above all my letters must wait, but I pray the ones sent in the past week keep reaching you gradually, Lenny. My dad was among the first Americans to reach Fort Ebenemel in Belgium immediately after the Germans retreated. And again, that was a lucky break. He sent home four huge Nazi flags to, the, to be used by the Union to raise money for the war effort. And these flags were literally the size of, of this row of chairs. And they were humongous. And they covered them with dollar bills for the war effort. So the family story, well, first I'll just read this, sorry. 10, 1017, Dear Lenny, two of the Nazi flags you sent came today. I guess the other two will come shortly. Boy, they are tremendous in size. I didn't think they would be anywhere as, as big when you wrote about them. I did get a very peculiar feeling when I opened them. I felt like tearing them to shreds, and then I thought it over, and I realized they're symbols and not the enemy, Diana. 
But the family story is when those first two flags arrived, um, my, they were both very smelly and musty and dirty. They had been flying over the fort. And the first thing my grandmother did was run to the window and start to pull in the pulley. And some of you may remember from apartment buildings years ago, they hung the laundry out the window with clothespins and a pulley. So as my grandmother starts to do this, my mother starts screaming, Mama, Mama, are you crazy? You can't hang a Nazi flag out the window in Brooklyn. <laughs> and so that's been, always been a family story. <laughs> With time, my parents' stress and strain increased. Here my mom shares her true feelings. This is December already, December 20th. Dear Lenny, Darling, you didn't give me any unnecessary worry in those long four letters, you know. I have a pretty fair idea of what an infantry soldier does. And as I've said many times, I want to know as much as I can. If I sounded a little scared, well, darling, I am. And I think I have cause to be, even though I agree with all the reasons you've listed for me not to worry. You know what I mean, don't you? I'm proud and I'm happy with what you're doing, but I'm also worried, and I'm waiting so impatiently for our better future. Those are the contradictions, darling. I guess you face them also. I think you're doing a fine job. Just keep it up, and I'll be OK. Year three, dad's luck turns. On January 21st, 1945, <coughs> he was severely injured at the Battle of the Bulge. How did he survive in the snow until help came hours later? Where was he evacuated to? Where was he treated? And what was the impact of being hospitalized for almost a year and a half? What new medications did he benefit from? And how did an experimental treatment help him to recover? And why was the story written up in Life magazine? On the cover. <laughs> January 22nd, dearest, no letters because 120 and 121 was a lot of war. 121, I was wounded in action, honorably but seriously. I want to get this out to you before the telegram. It took a 105 millimeter gun on a German self-propelled tank at 10 yards to get your husband. It was because I obeyed orders against my better judgment that my luck ran out. Lenny, P.S. Break the news gently to my folks. January 25th. Dearest, I'm really comfortably in a big modern hospital near Paris. It may take some time, but I, am, I will be okay. Thanks to plasma, six pints, penicillin, about a few dozen needles, and sulfur, I seem in pretty good shape and much less pain than I would expect, not more than when I had my tonsils out. I had one very bad moment psychologically when they carried me in here and laid me on a real bed with sheets in a warm room. The realization brought back for one mo moment all the concentrated horrors of the past five weeks, and it was hard to bear for a while. Sorry I won't be at the finish line, but I did a good job running intelligence for the guys carrying the ball. And don't worry, I'll be home, and okay too. Please tell the folks not to be too worried, and take care of yourself, and Betty Lou, let our friends know, as I shall not be writing much. February 8th. For the first time since you are in the Army, I find it difficult to write a letter. This is the third time I've started. I destroyed the other two. It's not that I don't know what to say. It's that I don't know how to say the words that are in my heart. Dearest, how are you? I'm trying very hard to be worthy of you during this very difficult and painful period you're going through. You see, Lenny, when I received the letter from you that you were hurt, it took all my assurance out from under me, and I broke down and I cried as I haven't in a long time. I guess all the accumulated months of tension were now released. Now, of course, I've had more mail from you, and I know more of the details. I'm back on my feet again and trying to do you proud, Diana. How did my mom manage to go to Massachusetts to visit my dad from New York? What was it like when he finally came home? And how old was I, and how did I react to his coming home? My talk only gives you a taste of the many different topics discussed by the sheer volume of the letters. You need to buy my book to learn all of it. Their letters tell the extraordinary story of the triumphs and sacrifices of ordinary people in an extraordinary time. Thank you.
take questions. Sometimes that's the best part of this when we get really interesting questions. Yes. So um, you were raised in New York. Yes. How did you get here? Get here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I grew up in New York. We went to college in New York. We met. We married in New York, and then Sid got a job with IBM. And the first place they took us was Lexington, Kentucky, which was a real adventure. We were there four years. It's a beautiful town. And then we had the opportunity to come to Boulder. And we thought, oh, sure, what an adventure. We'll come to Boulder, we'll stay two years, and we'll go home. And 49 years later, here we are, <laughs> like many others who stayed. IBM stands for I've been moved. Right. Yeah, but we were lucky. We only got moved twice. Yes, you were. Yeah, actually, there was a third opportunity, but we turned it down to go to Tucson. We love Boulder, so we stayed. Yes. So, Liz, uh, when I was in Vietnam, it took 17 days for a letter to get from me to my wife. And this is a much more modern time, so I really identified with your parents during that terrifying time, especially for your mother. She didn't know that she got a letter if your, if your dad was like dad. Correct. The question is, yeah. uh, how did you get from Betty Lou, the baby that's, Betty that's, Lou? That's, to a, Liz? that's a frequent question. So, my, my formal name is Elizabeth Louise. They never called me that. They always called me Betty Lou, which to me always sounded kind of Southern. It just didn't fit me. And when I was 13, I went off to sleepaway camp and I came home. I said, I'm Liz. I will never answer to Betty again. And that's the story. Well, I can identify as Bear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you have another question? So uh, how long did uh, Okay. Okay. So, so after the war, my dad came home. He went back to um, his union job at the New York City Welfare Department, which was kind of a social work kind of a gig. But he knew he didn't want to do that for his life. So eventually, he got into education, and eventually, he developed his own vocational school in, New York, in Manhattan, New York City, where he trained. <laughs> They trained all kinds of skills, like New York civil service exams and carpet laying and hotel management. It was very, very, very diverse. And eventually he retired. Um, and being a historian, as I said from the beginning, which is why he saved the letters and wanted to tell the story, he eventually became an independent scholar of the poet John Milton. And that's what he did during his retirement years. And my mom worked in the school with him after we were a little bit older. Did she get the union built, I take it? Yes, yes, they did. But there was a lot of opposition. But they got the union going. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. How about discrimination? Some of the southerners didn't care for Jewish folks either. That's true. That's true. Um, my dad does not talk openly about any blatant discrimination. The only way it comes through is that he didn't. He was totally capable. And in training, he was even teaching classes on map reading and scouting, and he never really advanced. And that was the thought that that's where the anti-Semitism came in. But his um, training group was re actually really supportive of him. They really tried to get a promotion through. There, there were several they knew. Uh, right, offices just above him who tried to get promotions, and it just didn't happen. So, um, but that, that's a really good question. Yes? As a Jewish soldier, though, during World War II, yes. Weren't there specific guidance or things that they were told not to, you know, either show either in your dog tag? Well, yeah, or else? yeah. When he when he got into battle, he got rid of the dog tag. Yeah, because it identified you, absolutely. And you know, there are descriptions. In one point, he's in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the German guy, and he, my dad survived. The other guy didn't. So in that kind of a situation, you didn't want a dog tag that said he did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, would you describe your dad's wounds and why it took a year sure, and a half to sure, recover? Sure. And uh, if, did he have any uh, after effects sure. over the rest of his life? Sure. So, so he he turned out he was very lucky. He had he had a sort of a shrapnel wound around here. He had a wound here, but the most severe one was around his ankle, and so he needed to have skin graft because the flesh was gone. And that's really it was experimental. They were just developing it. He was in a trial with about 35 other guys, all in similar situations. And interestingly, it only worked for a handful of them. So my dad was very lucky. 
and it was a long process because they would graft a little bit, then they would have to see if it took, and then they would graft more, and that's why it, it took. So after about a year, um, so, and the only place they were doing this was in Boston. So here's my mom in New York with the baby, my dad's in Boston, no cars, I mean there's no fuel or anything, and they didn't have a car anyway. So she would, <laughs> my grandmother worked in a factory, as many of the Jewish Im immigrants did in New York City. Friday night, my grandmother would come home from work, my mom would get on a train, and she would stand, because it was, because there were soldiers, it was just crazy. She would go to this hospital outside of Boston and visit him. Sunday she would come back so my grandmother could go to work on Monday. And after about a year or maybe 14 months, my dad could come home for a weekend. He was on crutches, but he could come home. And so that went on, and then finally, um, he, it was, he was deemed healed, I guess, enough to come home, he came home. And, um, it was, it, you know, it's not surprising that my reaction was not very positive. You know, all of a sudden there's this man taking my mom's attention. I had no <laughs> clue who he was. And, and another family story is that, you know, in, when he was in the hospital, he was in occupational therapy, and so they, the guys were building toys, those that had children. And so he, was, he built this pull toy, and I guess he put a lot of effort into it. It was wooden, and it had wheels, and it pulled, and he handed it to me, and I threw it down and smashed it. How old were you? I was 18 months when he came home. <laughs> so, but eventually, he was a great dad. It just took a little time. Did he have any... Oh, so you asked about the residual, and I didn't really answer that. Remarkably, he, for a while he walked with a cane, probably until I was five or six, but then he gave that up and basically he really was fine for the most part, yep, yeah. What you said uh, now was the skin graft the miracle? Yeah, that was the miracle, and so the, the experimental treatment was written up in Life magazine. With a picture of, the, of, it. of it on the, of the skin grafting, some piece with skin grafting on the front cover. You don't, don't want to I see it. I don't bring it because it's very, very graphic. <laughs> but I do have a copy of it. Do you yes. have the copy here? I don't, in, in, in my house, I don't <laughs> bring It's really graphic. You really would not want to see the pictures. <laughs> but they put it on Life magazine. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, on the cover. Back yeah. in the 50s, right? Sure. Yes. I'd like to talk a little bit about your heritage, where, uh, what countries in Eastern Europe your grandparents emigrated from, okay. and also uh, how that was linked to the fact that your father was so multilingual. Okay, so, so um, my, my mom's parents came from the Ukraine, from a small, small village, which is called a shtetl, very few people. And um, my grandmother and grandfather met in that village, married, and came to America. My dad's parents were from Poland, and they both came to America separately and ended up meeting in Brooklyn and marrying in Brooklyn. And so they spoke Yiddish at home. Yiddish. And as a matter of fact, my mom spoke Yiddish when she went to kindergarten. She barely spoke English. And, um, and then my dad studied French in college, because remember he was a college graduate and he had a <coughs> master's degree. So he spoke French. He, he picked up German, because Yiddish is very, very close to it. You really can, a lot of the words are the same. And then, because he was a scholar, he was a lifelong scholar, when he was in Belgium, he picked up some, Belgi some Flemish, and, and the other, there's two languages there. And so he just had a facility, and he wasn't afraid to use it. You know, some people study, but then they can't open their mouth and the word doesn't come out. But he, he used it, so. And, and I guess he probably had more facility with languages than the other guys around. Polish, Ukrainian, Russian? Yeah. So, not, Did he have any facility? Not, not much of that, not much of that. Because the grandparents didn't speak if they spoke Yiddish. Once they came to America, they, they did not want to identify with anything from, I mean, they spoke Yiddish because they didn't really know English until they learned English. But um, those, that generation really wanted to forget. I mean, they left a lot of persecution and hardship and poverty. They were very poor. So what, brought, what brought them to this country? The streets were, were paved with gold. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? Uh, about 1912. 12 and 50. 1912, 1915. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. So did you ever uh, notice or did your mom ever talk or your dad talk about PTSD or any after effects psychologically? Yeah. So that, that, that's another question that I get. And, you know, I've done this talk 
about 30 times in person and maybe 20 times on Zoom. And sometimes somebody will say to me that my dad from World War II really suffered from PTSD. I guess my dad was a very strong person psychologically and he was able to compartmentalize. As I said, it was gone. He never talked about it. It was just... And so he went on and he just, you know, I, I was never aware of any emotional difficulties. And, you know, he may have had his private moments, I'm sure, because some of the descriptions are pretty graphic. But uh, fortunately, he was able to be a very successful businessman. Yeah. How did you and Sydney? We met in New, in New York. We were both in the same college. Yeah, we went on a college <laughs> weekend up to the Concord Hotel in the Catskills. If anybody's ever heard of the Concord <laughs> That's Hotel. how we met. Yeah. Ice skating was the first day. Yeah. This is not a question. Yeah. On a crew, I had a co-pilot who was from Brooklyn, who was Jew, uh, was Italian. Yeah. And one, an electronic warfare officer who was Jewish. And it turns out, in my conversation, they discovered they lived across the street from each other, <laughs> but they never crossed that street. Right. 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 Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. I'm a retired postal inspector, so I especially like letters. Okay. And uh, my, my mother kept a letter just like that one. Uh, when my father graduated from um, uh, flight school, he sent her an uh, engagement ring <laughs> in a letter like that. And when it was delivered, the diamond was sticking out of the letter, and the post office delivered it. But it was still there. So I'm proud of the post office <laughs> back I, in 1943. Yeah, I don't know if that would happen today. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I have copies of my book. The book is $28, and I'm happy to have anyone who is interested in it take it. It's also available at Amazon. Yeah. Thank you all. Oh, thank you so much. This isn't much of a Oh, thank you.